Thank you. Sorry for that. I was uh, making a wonderful opening statement, but I won't go back to it. Uh, I do want to say this is an exciting day, our first workshop uh, with uh, PSF that we've been planning for a couple of years. So thanks to Jason and everybody for setting this up. And let's go immediately to the slides, please. Thank you. Well, this is going to be a short presentation because Jason has the majority of the information to talk about. I want to make the, the point, though, and Sue has introduced this very nicely, that our, our program in PSF will be largely focused in freshwater and our watersheds, uh, maybe less so in the estuary. But the marine habitats are increasingly important, as Sue just showed you. And we have made a couple of steps into the uh, open ocean in the past couple of years. So I want to end on that and where we're heading. And uh, so let's go to the next slide. Everybody on this call is going to recognize the life cycle of salmon, but I think we're also all aware that the vast majority of our studies and our work and our money in the past has really been focused into the fresh water, a little bit less so to the estuaries, but these are very commonly highly degraded habitats that we are going to have to pay attention to in the future. And although the salmon spend the vast majority of their life in the ocean, it is certainly the area with the minimum of attention and ironically, our period of most activity in the ocean was back in the 1960s uh, at the time. But there isn't any question, as I hope I'll show you, and as Sue, as Sue introduced, there's very significant, significant evidence that the ocean habitat is now really determining a lot of our salmon returns. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this again is from Lori Weikamp, who always gives a very nice presentation to the Pacific Salmon Commission meetings. Uh, we know about the blob, and this just reinforces Sue again. So the blob event was not unique because now we have marine heat waves that are a recognized event in the marine environment. Uh, they existed in 2019 and 2020. And probably the most disturbing slide to me is the next slide, please. So in NOAA, in tracking this information, is projecting a marine heat wave again in 2021. But it's interesting to me that as you see the progression, the way they've presented this, we see a building uh, heat wave in the Pacific from the west to the east in this case. But by summertime, that is a very substantial blob. And maybe it's a blob times two or three or four. But it's going to be a significant event if this forecast is uh, actually correct. Let's go to the next slide because while we're tracking the temperatures on the surface, and Sue gave you a great uh, plot there about it's not just the surface, it's, it's deep water as well. We know much, much less about the effect of this in biology though. And the one paper that really caught my eye is this one looking at sand lance in uh, Prince William Sound. But I only took a couple of sentences out here. So what we're looking at is the effect in the blob years where we have a 90% loss of body energy, so body fats in this critical food item that salmon would depend on in that region. So if this is any indication of the biological impact that we're seeing, we need to be out there and we need to understand what the effect between climate to oceans to fisheries, many fisheries, not just salmon, uh, really is going to be. I think 2020, we go to the next slide. This is similar to Sue where she showed you the Canadian catch. Well, what we have here is the catch by all countries in 2020, well, the, the whole time since 1970. And you can see how catch in metric tons has actually gotten up to exceeding a million metric tons a year in several years in the recent decade plus. But in 2020, this declined by 40% in a single year. That is a catastrophic loss of food and that. And so while we may think that all of the factors interact in terms of the freshwater, the estuary and the oceans, you can't have the breadth of effect and the magnitude of effect in a single year without attributing it largely to the ocean environment. 
So this is a real call to arms in terms of what's going on. Let's go to the next slide and just look at our favorite population, of course, the Fraser sockeye salmon. And that, and that is in the left slide. I've just put the last 20 years here and that, and it's a trend uh, in catch relative to the long-term average. The long-term average in this case is 1997 to 2018. And of course, everybody on this call probably realizes that 2019 and 20 were the lowest in history. They were fractions of the 2009 that caused the Cohen Commission. What I think we need to recognize though, is that this is a signal that has been coming for a while. The trend line is very consistent. You can see it by eye. You don't even really need my one line that I put in there to show you. Sue also mentioned that these trends are not the same everywhere. So I just put two of the Southern BC other populations. So many fisheries are limited by the status of the interior Fraser coho salmon. That's the upper right. And coho are not showing a trend like Fraser sockeye, and they're actually increasing very recently. And if you go to our Southern BC index of Cowich and Fall Chinook, they have a very different pattern. So I have to support what Sue said, that these events are not having equal effect everywhere. And that is probably some of the information that we have to really gather to sort out where this effect is and how significant it's going to be. Let's go to the next slide. I want to just touch very briefly on that we see the work that we're doing in the Gulf of Alaska as an extension of the Salish Sea. Um, I think the problem that we're seeing here now is very much an issue of climate change, links to oceanography and ultimately to fisheries. And we simply don't have that information. It's sadly lacking and we need to understand that. And Sue made the, fi the final point about marine heat waves, so I won't go back to that. So my final two slides here, next one, please. This I put in, these are the results of the trawl sampling in the two years that we've been in the Gulf of Alaska. And I really just wanted to emphasize a few points. Our catches out there have been very much less than expected. All right, now those years turned into our very poor return, so they could easily be related. And it's only a sample of two years. We caught very, very few pink salmon. The most abundant salmon in the North Pacific is largely absent from our samples. We find that the catches are highly heterogeneous. We have many trawl samples that turn out to have zero catch. Um, the trawls did catch salmon, but we have a significant concern about future research in terms of how the trawls actually function. And the final point is this is a massive area to study that's going to take a major effort for us to really understand salmon. So our interest in the Salmon Foundation going forward in the marine environment is the last slide. So we have programs continuing in the Salish Sea and that's under Isabel Pearsall's guidance and that those programs will continue. We have recently received sufficient funds that we think we can continue work in March 2022 in the Gulf of Alaska. And we will be using uh, research gill nets to test the catchability of the trawls. Uh, we also were funded to hire two scientists to develop a research program that would be required to link climate to oceans to salmon. The issue of linking to fish is a very significant limitation that a lot of oceanographic work has not followed up on in the past, and we need to fix that. And ultimately, the design of this research will lead to what we hope is a much larger multi-year program in the future, potentially linked to the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainability. So that's my quick pitch. Um, pass it back to you, Jason. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Brian. That uh, is a, a, a great setup. And uh, I, uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, walk through a, a bit of a, a context perspective from PSF and then describe some of the specific things that we're thinking about from a, a climate adaptation perspective to uh, share our thinking with our audience and to hopefully invite your perspective and feedback on, on what we're thinking and where we hope we're going. So uh, I'm, I'll provide a few perspectives. I'm going to talk about our current activities and I'm going to talk about what some of our, our, our ideas are for future uh, projects and priorities. 
Uh, as we've heard from, from uh, all of our speakers so far this morning, many salmon populations are depressed. We have seen and heard that salmon habitat has been impacted by human activity and development. And as uh, our speakers have highlighted, climate change is adding new factors, which we really don't fully understand. Uh, this slide I realize is hard to read. I've used it a few times before, but this is a, a listing of, of Southern BC Kosiwik assessments. And don't worry about reading it. Most of you uh, in, in the session today will know uh, uh, something of this. And the point here is that out of all these uh, Southern BC Chinook populations that were assessed, only three were found to be not at risk, the ones that are, are noted in green here. And so the, the, the takeaway I, I would uh, mark for you on this is that we've got a lot of salmon populations that are not doing very well, they're in trouble, and we need to think about what we do and how we can help these populations. Uh, as uh, Brian and others have spoken around, uh, we also have problems with sockeye. Fraser sockeye in 2020 was the worst churn on record, and as Brian indicated, this is part of a trend. And you know, really, in summary, we're seeing all kinds of things that are affecting our salmon from the changes in the ocean. Uh, we're seeing landscape level changes like uh, Gord Starrett spoke of with regard to the pine beetle epidemic. There are fires, there are flood events, there's drought, there are changes in snowpack and precipitation as uh, Francis spoke to earlier this morning. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of conditions where we're seeing significant drought. Uh, this is an interior stream. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can imagine if you're a juvenile uh, coho or chinook that uh, is trying to spend a year in fresh water uh, on a day like this is not the easiest uh, place to make a living. We're seeing uh, effects of the large fires coming through the interior. Uh, the modelers and forecasters are telling us we're going to see more of this. If we could see it coming, as Sue is showing us, we don't want to be looking in the rearview mirror. We want to be looking forward saying, if this is going to happen, what do we do? Uh, we are seeing flooding and overland flow. This is uh, in the Hat Creek area in the Bonaparte watershed. And uh, this is uh, some of the gully washouts that came following the large fires and a uh, picture of a house with Hat Creek in behind it showing just how much sediment is coming off the land and getting into the valley bottoms where uh, our salmon habitat is. Uh, we're seeing significant change in forest land cover. This is just an example, but you can go to um, many, many uh, watersheds or areas in the interior of BC and some places on the coast and see very significant change over the last 20 years in the forest land cover. And of course, we all know about Big Bar. Uh, I was able to ask Gord Starrett a few questions on that today, but just another example of on top of everything else, these natural events like Big Bar are compounding things and, and, and adding challenges for our wild salmon. And it's important to think about these effects because the effects aren't just affecting people like those of us that have gathered here today who have some particular and specific interest on salmon. It also has broader effects around our economy, around our broader ecosystem, and, and, uh, and social and cultural effects. These effects can be direct, they can be indirect, and these effects can be local, but they can also be very far reaching. You know, and I think, again, most people on the call today, as an example, will know about the story around how Fraser River Chinook, in particular, are seen to be very important food sources for southern resident killer whales. So just to spend a minute uh, giving a brief description of, of the Pacific Salmon Foundation, how we're organized and the kinds of things we're thinking about. And uh, I found it useful at times to describe what we're working on in and around a, a salmon life cycle model. We, I'm going to speak to all of these programs uh, briefly. Uh, and uh, the thing that we are looking for your input on today is the one on the top right with the yellow bar, bar or box around it, the Climate Adaptation Program for Salmon. This is something that we are embarking on, starting out new. We would like to build momentum, energy, and progress on it, similar to the path that PSF has been able to take with some of our other programs. And uh, we're really uh, keen to get your input and, and thoughts on this today. So turning briefly, just to give you an overview, and I'm going to touch very quickly on, on our, our programs and their connections to the, the climate adaptation and, and salmon theme. Our marine science program uh, uh, has uh, uh, evolved from the Salish Sea Marine Survival Program that, that PSF uh, launched in partnership with, with many, including uh, people who are on the, on the call today with us. 
Uh, our program is continuing with monitoring to collect data, ideally long-term, so that we can see changes and effects in the ecosystem. We're continuing to visualize the data that we collect so that it can be used to inform decision-making. We're working on thinking about how to restore habitat in light of climate change considerations and building community, educating and, and providing tools to help people. Uh, briefly, we have a citizen science program under our marine programs that are looking at collecting oceanographic data. Uh, we have sample sites where we're trying to collect data consistently so we can get trends over time. We're adding data every year and uh, we're using it to inform uh, information from bottom up like temperature, plankton, algae, primary production, bloom timing, etc. Because you need this kind of information to understand what's going on so that you could say, so what do we do about it? Uh, we have something called the Strait of Georgia Data Center. I hope you've had a chance to have a look at it. It's an open access data platform established in 2012. And there are many, many data layers in here, about 250 that are being pulled into something that's called the Marine Reference Guide, which will be coming out this summer. And it'll be a very useful tool to be able to see the changes in the Strait of Georgia area. And one example is we're using this information in a new program that we're advancing for uh, bottlenecks to survival, where we are looking at this to see where can we find juvenile fish so that we can tag them uh, with pit tags for further study. We also have a, a nearshore uh, habitat resilience and restoration program, and we're looking at how we can restore these areas in light of sea level rise, storm surge, changes in temperatures. We're looking at what they're doing in neighboring jurisdictions like the United States and trying to bring that kind of information forward. Uh, and we uh, have recently, uh, through uh, Isabel, Isabel Pearsall, our, our program director, uh, uh, embarking on a soft shores program through uh, funding that she wrote a grant for to Environment and Climate Change Canada. And we will be partnering with the Stewardship Centre of BC and others to increase community knowledge of nature-based solutions. So this will include soft shores and taking care of shorelines that will be undergoing and experiencing climate change issues. And these are important not just for salmon, but also as habitat for forage fish, which are a fundamental part of the salmon ecosystem. I'm going to turn next uh, to touch briefly on our Salmon Watersheds program and the, the, the real flagship uh, product that our, uh, this team of ours has developed called the Pacific Salmon Explorer. I hope you've had a chance to see this at some point in your, in your salmon travels, but the PSE is an interactive data visualization tool for tracking and reporting on the status of Pacific Salmon Conservation Units and their freshwater habitats in BC. And this currently presents the best publicly available information, currently covering about 80% of salmon CUs, and we're working to include the remaining 20%. So for each CU, we provide a suite of information on indicators of salmon population status and risk of habitat degradation and pressures. Uh, we're, use, we're using this kind of information to support the ideas that were in the DFO wild salmon policy and it, the wild salmon policy, at least in my interpretation, basically said understand the state of your salmon populations, understand the state of the habitat, and the devel then develop an integrated plan moving forward. But all of that requires you to do those first two things and get that information out into the hands of everybody that wants to be involved in the conversation and the solutions. And while that might sound like a simple exercise, it is very, very difficult to gather all of the, the broad suites of data, organize it into a way that is reasonably intuitive and usable. And, and our team has had great success in getting it to where it is and we are continuing with this work. And we have recently submitted a BC Thrift proposal to advance this further. And in particular, we have climate aspects to this proposal, which include uh, incorporating climate pressure indicators into the Pacific Salmon Explorer and also starting to incorporate information on the vulnerability of salmon sea use to future climate pressures. So this is some of the kinds of thinking that Sue Grant was touching on. Um, we are hoping to hear in the next few weeks on the success of this proposal. It's, it's moved in to a full proposal frame and we understand it's currently under review. 
our community salmon program is is is, a, is part of the Pacific Salmon Foundation that many people will know about. This is where we provide grants to community organizations to do habitat restoration, support community enhancement, do monitoring, and also for stewardship and education. Uh, we have been uh, working with our partner organizations and, and those groups that we support to start to bring them into these kinds of conversations around climate change and climate adaptation for salmon. And as an example, one of the uh, projects that we have uh, recently issued a grant to is being done on the east coast of Vancouver Island, being led by Kate O'Neill, who uh, works for Current Environmental. And she is working with a group of local stewards to identify thermal refugia on and some of the streams on the east coast of Vancouver Island, recognizing that this is likely to be a critical factor in the well-being and future of salmon in this area. So even uh, community organizations who are not necessarily uh, salmon professionals are looking at these kinds of questions and circumstances and saying, how do we start to wrap our heads around this and what can we do? So this now takes us to the PSF idea around climate adaptation program for salmon. Uh, as we've touched on, many of the climate related trends uh, are going to make things more difficult for many of our salmon populations. But there is still time to moderate, moderate and mitigate the, the effects to support ongoing salmon productivity. The, the message that uh, we like to lead with from PSF is salmon are resilient. We should not give up be, just because things are difficult. We do need to be thoughtful and practical about what we're going to do, but we need to be deliberate about it as well. And that's part of uh, uh, embarking on this conversation and being deliberate about having a plan and a program to think about climate adaptation for salmon here at the PSF. Uh, what we have started with is, uh, besides this workshop, is uh, a BC SURF submission that had three project components to it. And many of you may have heard about these through conversations that, that me or others from the PSF team have shared. One of the first ideas that we have is to look at assessing uh, potential impediments in, for salmon migration at the major fish passage facilities and other locations in the Fraser. We started with this idea back in 2019, even before the big bar slide was detected, uh, thinking that in light of climate change, warmer water, changes in flows, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, depressed conditions that many of the populations were experiencing in the Fraser, it might make sense to look at where there are potential impediments and see if there are things that we can do to reduce the delay and make migration a little bit easier and maybe offset or mitigate some of the effects that these salmon populations are experiencing. The big bar slide has really driven that home in terms of how important it is. And we have a proposal uh, in with SRIFT now to start looking at, uh, under, at tagging fish, monitoring them on the way up the Fraser, matching that work with the work that DFO and others are doing uh, to monitor fish passage past Big Bar to really better understand where there are migration impediments in the Fraser and start to think about strategies and plans to maybe uh, uh, mitigate those effects. We have another idea uh, to look at having uh, developing a landscape strategy or a playbook for salmon following major fires. I showed a slide of what's happened in the Hat Creek area following the large fires there where there's significant uh, overland flow and mud and debris and sediment being swept down gullies into streams and affecting salmon habitat. The fires are likely going to be increasing and continuing. There's nothing we can do about it in the near term, but I think what we can do is start to say, if these fires are going to happen, what can we do to accelerate recovery, to mitigate effects, and try to prevent some of these uh, consequences to salmon, to give them a little bit of a boost so they're not just having to endure all of this on their own. We have a lot that we can do on the forest landscape in terms of uh, treating the terrestrial ecosystem. And what we would like to do is gather that information and best practices and develop it into a plan for focusing on the aquatic ecosystem, mitigation and recovery following large fires. And then our last uh, project that we've submitted is around improving the genetic baseline for our, our conservation units and wild salmon to inform conservation and recovery actions. One of my associates, Richard Bailey, when I was talking to him last summer about the urgent need for recovery and conservation planning in the Fraser, he said, 
you really need to stop and make sure you think about what you want to conserve before you start doing stuff. And, and I, I hadn't really put my mind to it. I said, isn't it obvious we want to conserve the conservation units? But through that conversation and through following up with others, we've come to understand that it's very likely that there are genetic adaptations, even within conservation units, that could be very important ecologically. Things like maybe being predisposed to better temperature tolerance or slightly different migration timing or slightly different emergence timing. And the point of this uh, exercise, if we are uh, approved to undertake it, would be to understand that better so that we have that information to inform uh, conservation recovery, things like conservation enhancement, um, targeted restoration, uh, perhaps even uh, tracking to how the fisheries are managed. So that's a brief summary of the projects that we've put in to BC SRIF at present and that PSF uh, will hope to embark on whether SRIF funds them or whether we need to seek funding for these from other sources. We do have a list of other ideas that are not as well developed and this is where we really want to get into a conversation with the people that are joining us today and explore some of this space and we know we are not the only people thinking about this. We know that in the interior there is a, 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 an advancing initiative on the Nicola looking at, at a watershed plan for the Nicola. We know that in the Okanagan, they, they, they're, they're actually fairly far ahead in some of this thinking and they have a very advanced and successful uh, process called the fish water management tool. But at the PSF, uh, the list here are things that we are thinking about that we think are fundamental and important and are looking at some of the key factors that, that uh, intersect with salmon and climate change. So things like water strategy, uh, looking at estuary planning and priorities and restoration, recognizing there's going to be sea level rise, thinking about having integra integrated watershed strategies that recognize that the, the climate change scenarios that are before us and thinking forward as Sue has implored us not to look in the rear view mirror to inform our restoration enhancement uh, and things like uh, land securement. Uh, I'm, I, we've got other ideas here, I won't necessarily just read my slide to you, but the point of this is to give you some idea about the things that we're thinking about and we think there is a lot of space to explore this, uh, partner with others and, and build on these kinds of ideas. Uh, in terms of the strategic considerations that we bring to the table, um, I like to touch on the fact about thinking what are we going to do and really habitat, hatcheries and the management of harvest or fishing are the levers that we can do something with. We know that we're going to need to continually evolve our thinking and our strategies in light of climate change and conservation needs, but we know we can make a difference. But we think it's important uh, to emphasize that it's going to take time, it's going to take investment, it's going to take political and public will. And we should not expect short-term results. These are long-term issues, it's going to take time, but also if we don't invest now and start pushing for change now, we are going to continually fall behind and the problems are going to get worse. And I think with our collective uh, energies, investment, and all of the capacity that we have, we can harness that to make things better. So we are pursuing things at the PSF that have the potential in our view to make a significant difference at the population of watershed scale. And we really want to bring our energy and capacity uh, forward with the help uh, and, and with the participation and collaboration with many partners to help advance these things. And again, as Sue Grant said, all pulling the same way in the same direction in a coordinated way. Uh, as I start to wrap up, you know, I think it's important to uh, recognize that salmon ecology is complex. We have ideas, but we really don't know all the answers. Uh, there are many, many things that interact and we need to be mindful of that as we think forward. And I use a slide like this, uh, usually not with a group like has gathered today, but in other groups where people see the problem and they, they know it's important and they want to do something about it. But as an example, and this is not at all to, to pick on any one entity or one issue, but we hear there's a salmon problem, well we need to ramp up production at hatcheries. But the people who call for that sometimes don't appreciate what it is that hatcheries do, what they're good at, how they can be effectively used, but how there can also be uh, unintended negative effects of ramping something up when you haven't thought it all the way through. So the point of a slide like this is while we do want to build enthusiasm and energy for taking action and thinking forward about climate change, we want to recognize that it's complex and, and be thoughtful and prudent in choosing our path forward. 
So with that, uh, that's the end of, of my talk and Brian's. And I think uh, between now and lunchtime, uh, Marcel, we'd like to turn back to you to, uh, to moderate a bit of discussion on what Brian and I have shared. Awesome. Thank you both for the uh, presentations. Uh, lots of information there, lots of stuff to think about. I'm hoping everybody's, uh, you know, been thinking about where you could intersect, where you could, uh, you know, think about your place and these uh, many ideas that have been shared. So there's a bunch of questions here. We only have about maybe 10, 15 minutes. We can bleed a little into lunch if the questions are good. Let's check it out. What is the order of magnitude of expenditure, expenditure that we would need to consider for ocean science? Where do we start? Well, that's a good question to start with. Uh, that is why we have sought funds to hire two scientists to really define what the necessary study would entail. There are some big numbers that people have thrown around about how much it's going to cost to do this, but I think it's only really responsible to talk money once we get our design. So that's why we have somebody, we have two people with funds for two, for a year to do this. The ballpark to start with is about $30 million because even though we have new technologies and innovations to how to measure the ocean and so on, you can't avoid getting out and sampling the fish at some point in time. So each cruise for a month is roughly a million dollars plus and that, uh, so it's gonna add up. Uh, so there's no way of shying from it. It will be expensive, probably in the 30 to $40 million range for a five-year program. Uh, thanks, Brian. The next one is from Wayne Solowski. Jason, although the province of BC has stated salmon recovery is a provincial priority, I fail to see policy changes or staffing additions that are helpful to facilitate this objective. Do you have any sense of when these shortcomings will be brought forward and implemented? Uh, well, hi, Wayne. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, I think uh, your crystal ball there is probably as good as anybody's, but my, my comment on that would be uh, I'm I am pleased to see the, the province moving directly uh, on some of these things. Appointing Finn Donnelly as a parliamentary secretary for Salmon, I think is a great step. That absolutely needs to be followed up by uh, tangible actions, uh, as you're touching on, in terms of, of policy, in terms of resourcing, in terms of, uh, of investments. And I uh, haven't seen that yet. I know that the provincial budget is, is going to be coming, uh, I think it's uh, next week or maybe this week for just following the federal budget. So we will see the uh, insight, the, the little bit that I have at this time is that we shouldn't expect big things immediately, but uh, with Finn uh, being in this coordinating role now, I think that we should expect there's going to be more to come. But. I'll stop with that, and Brian, and see if you wanted to add anything further to Wayne's question. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything more to add. I think that we are all expecting to see something in terms of the salmon strategy in the federal, and then there will probably be a follow-up in the provincial budget, but I, I don't have anything specific to add. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, moving forward then, um, Rupert Gale, what is the status of the final report for Salish Sea Marine Survival Project? Well, I'm uh, happy to say that the synthesis report amongst the, all the participants has been finalized. We're doing a literally final edit on it. And credit goes to Isabel Pearsall for leading that on our side and pulling this all together. Uh, it's a large report. It's complicated. There's a lot of science and that. And so the other thing we're doing is trying to write some uh, simpler sort of uh, short blurbs in terms of what people can do, what the main messages actually are and that, but the, the sort of final report synthesis is actually now done. So not publicly released for a, a little bit yet. Thanks, Brian. Uh, keep moving here. So uh, how is the PSF working with the province on habitat visualization? I believe the province has similar products that will be going online. Will there be cooperation? I'll speak to that as, as best I can at the moment. And uh, I, it looks like it says it's anonymous for wherever asked. So I'm, I'd be happy to take that offline for follow-up if you'd like and connect you with uh, Katrina Connors, our program director. We, we are 
working on our visualization for habitat independently at the moment, but, but using provincial data sources to develop that, uh, primarily provincial data sources. We are actively having conversations with provincial people who are working on this. Uh, I've been uh, working on a little informal working group with the province and DFO to talk about the PSF data visualization, what the province is doing, and some of the emerging needs and interests that DFO has in terms of reporting on the state of fish and fish habitat in Canada. So I would say we don't have a formal arrangement at this time, but our lines of communication are open and I think for the most part we have the right people talking to each other and uh, we're uh, in a reasonable uh, state to understand what each other is doing and look at how we can best uh, coordinate and not duplicate or trip over each other as we do this work. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, still got about eight minutes. Greg Knox from the Skeena, welcome. So Greg asks, with the frequent warm ocean conditions, less food in the NP, do you think the massive amounts of hatchery fish being released 5 billion, approximately 40% of salmon in the North Pacific are hatchery, are impacting our wild salmon. Should we be limiting hatchery releases to ensure our wild salmon have enough food? You want to take that one, Jason? Well, I'll start with a little bit of I, the story. I was kidding, but... <laughs> <laughs> All yours, Let, let me lead off. I'm, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Greg. I mean, it's uh, certainly a very common concern. And uh, I have to say that from two years of being out there, uh, we're not seeing a lack of food. And so this is becoming a very interesting question biologically. There isn't any question that we're seeing more and more evidence of competition between uh, salmon species and between the uh, salmon from different areas and hatchery programs. And that are we at a point where we should be talking about limiting uh, hatchery production, I'm not sure we're at that point. I think really we need to look more locally in Canada first. Um, and then there's going to be the issue of mixing out in the North Pacific, but there really are different regions of the North Pacific. Uh, so where this, where the pink are, for example, uh, this is a bit of an unknown at this point in time. So I don't have the evidence or any sort of technical basis to really uh, support that. Our sampling shows enormous amounts of food and uh, that one of the interesting thing is that the diets are very diversified and a huge contribution from squid that we almost never talk about in terms of our coastal waters. Uh, so I don't know that we believe that there is less food in the North Pacific just because it's warmer. It could be a different type of food and that uh, there's massive numbers of mctophids, the deep water fishes and that so these are the sort of important questions that we really want to tackle by being out there. And I think without being out there, you're not gonna build the evidence to uh, support making changes in the future. Well, Thanks, Brian, Brian, maybe I'll just build on that with, with a couple of comments and observations. Um, first, Greg, thanks for the question. And I, I know Greg knows this, but maybe not everybody on the call knows this, that uh, PSF is working on a hatchery effectiveness study right now uh, funded by BC Thrift, uh, and uh, we've briefed Greg and, and others on it. And, and essentially, we're, we're looking at some of the questions around hatchery effectiveness and, hatch, and doing what we can to understand and unpack some of the hatchery wild interactions from our BC facilities. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important to put our Canadian hatchery production into context, because I would say there. I would agree entirely with Greg's point around there being a lot of hatchery fish in the North Pacific. But the hatchery production from Canada and from British Columbia is a very, very small fraction of the overall production into the North Pacific. I, I believe uh, if I read the numbers correctly, mm -hmm. if, if you factor in all of our enhanced production, which uh, would include the spawning channels for sockeye, we're in the neighborhood of five to 6%. And if you look only at the, the fish that are, are dealt with in a hatchery and not a, sort of a spawning channel where they, they mostly look after themselves, we're, we're in the range of two to 3%. So uh, if, while I'm not saying that that means we shouldn't be mindful of our hatchery production in Canada, the big driver for the number of hatchery fish in the North Pacific is not coming from Canada. It's coming from Russia, Alaska, and Japan. 
But Brian, I, I would just maybe check that with you in case there was anything that should be corrected or sharpened from that. No, 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 those are the right sort of magnitudes for a Canadian enhancement. Uh, the biggest hatchery programs in the world now is in Russia. Uh, and then in Chum in Japan used to be, they still have the same sort of numbers that release, but the major production of uh, pink and chum is from uh, east coast of Russia now. Okay, thanks guys. We've got a couple more we'd like to get through. I want to comment and two questions. So Richard Bailey writes, all the questions when taken in context really point for the need for a governance structure to bring all four levels of government together to act in a coordinated manner to plan habitat restoration to restore ecosystem functionality. That's a comment from Richard Bailey. Um, question. Well, uh, Marcel, I'll, I'll just provide a, a brief response to that. Maybe that's something that we can bring out in the uh, open dialogue in the afternoon around uh, that seems like a reasonable idea. Do other people agree with that? And if so, what are some of the ways we might be able to activate that kind of, of thought? So I'll just maybe mark that for us to pick up this afternoon. I screenshotted it, so it's good to go. Thanks. Um, let's have a look. Question. Could you repeat which organization PSF is working with to identify thermal refugia on eastern Vancouver Island? Uh, thanks, Kristen, for that question. I can't remember actually the name of the of the uh, community organization that we have uh, led that partnership with. But uh, Kate O'Neill is with uh, Current Environmental, uh, a, uh, a consulting firm, and she's the lead technical person on the project. But if you want to contact me offline, I, I could connect you with the, the, the group that's actually leading that project with us. Thanks, Jason. Uh, any updated information about the Columbia Treaty process from Keith Dublacania, Dublacanica? Um, Brian, is that something you have insight on from your uh, your panel uh, discussions? No, I mean, my involvement really is the Pacific Salmon Commission, and uh, we deal with the Okanagan under the treaty, but we very much have not addressed the Upper Columbia Treaty discussion. That's pretty much led by the provincial group, and I, I really am, I'm sorry, I don't really have a good update. Yeah, I'm not so involved I either, so... Uh, just by way of information, the Columbia River Intertribal Fisheries Commission also has lots of information on that. They have a great website. You can find recent information there. Uh, finally, uh, and it's 12 o'clock, uh, looks like the last question. Oh, somebody else has come in, but let's have a look. Has there been any thought to engage in land use planning, which could consider to be another level above watershed planning? Salmon problems are social and economic. If you don't address those, you can't get to the solution. Uh I'm not sure who asked that, but I think I would entirely agree with that in, as, a, as a concept. What I'm not sure about is how you go about activating that in light of different jurisdictional authorities, uh, different contexts around uh, BC and, and thinking into the Yukon as well. So I would entirely agree with that idea but would welcome input and dialogue in terms of what an entity like PSF can do to help advance that or support others in advancing that. Oh, thanks, Jason. And then finally, uh, it says, how is the PSF supporting Indigenous-led initiatives, habitat restoration, stewardship, cons conservation projects? Are there some uh, PSF initiatives, partnerships with Indigenous organizations, I guess? It's anonymous, so I don't know who wrote it. It looks like it came from you, Marcel. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead. No, I, I appreciate the question, and I would say this yeah. is something that, that PSF is, is, has been actively considering uh, in terms of our engagement, support, and collaboration with First Nations. Uh, our, we have had act, a recent conversation between our PSF management team and our board recognizing the importance uh, of uh, establishing a, a good connection and, a, and appropriate and respectful working relationships with First Nations who, as I said in my opening comments, uh, PSF recognizes that indelible relationship with salmon and with our landscape. So we do have a number of projects that are First Nations led that we are providing funding to through our community salmon program. Uh, our Pacific Salmon Explorer team and our Salmon Watersheds program team 
are actively working with First Nations, both on uh, validating information on the state of salmon, state of habitat, but also on applying further um, modern tools to uh, inform monitoring and assessment. And we have partnerships with First Nations uh, around some of the work that we're doing in our marine science programs as well. And I, I won't get into that in detail. So we are active, but I don't think we are finished in terms of, of our conversation and our progress uh, in this light. And it is something that we are committed to continuing with from PSF. And Brian, I'll just see if there's anything you wanted to add to that. No, I think it's uh, it's a good question, and uh, it's a discussion that we've had in PSF during my time and now Mike's. Uh, we'd like to uh, strengthen our role in that. Uh, we have tried a couple of things in terms of uh, salmon monitoring and what we call the salmon vision network. People all working together to improve our monogram. Uh, PS, the salmon explorer comes into place. It could house the data, but it can also could be a recepting tool to build the data. Uh, and um, I think there's a real role in developing water monitoring across BC that we've tried to promote a couple of times, uh, particularly under climate change. Uh, the Water uh, Sustainability Act uh, speaks of minimum ecological flows, but there's been a very slow development of that. And we've actually suggest suggested we could work with a variety of of communities, all communities in BC, to monitor flows and compare them against models that might be used to define minerals. I think there's lots of opportunity for collaboration, but we acknowledge that we have not fully engaged that community. Thank you, gentlemen. I think uh, definitely lots with BC Shrif. There are the Aram bodies. Uh, there are many points of uh, uh, where we could potentially converge the two organizations. It's up to the folks that are on these calls and potentially ones in the future to start thinking about how they would like that to happen. I think that that, and based on Sue's comments about, we all need each other here, so let's not hit each other. So yeah, let's explore that. And that's what this workshop is hoping, hoping to achieve. So let's, let's end it there. We're about five minutes after. Let's reconvene at one o'clock precisely. Uh, we will be with Dr. Jonathan Moore whom I've had the privilege of seeing before. So this should be good and interesting. And then we'll move into the Slido, all the questions, and then we'll start to look for some feedback and get into some dialogue and then next steps. So have a good lunch, bon appetit, bon provecho, and uh, we'll talk after lunch. Thanks, Marcel. Okay.